Good morning. Welcome to church. Special welcome to our guest. I'm so glad you're here with us today. Welcome to those joining us online as well. We're going to jump right in this morning to Matthew chapter 1. We're continuing our series called The Kingdom as we walk through the gospel of Matthew. And we're going to hit a part today that if we were honest, most of us skim or skip entirely. So I really want to challenge you as I read the genealogy of Jesus. Pray for me, pray for me as I pronounce the names. But as I, as I read the genealogy of Jesus, I want to challenge you with this from God's word that no word of scripture is wasted. That every word of God is profitable. And so even the ones that don't seem relevant on the surface, I'm telling you, studying this past week, the genealogy of Jesus is bursting with narrative. It's overflow. It's dripping with theology and truth. And I'm going to try my best today to bring some of that treasure out and to put it on the table, to put the food on the table for the people of God. And it's up to you if you're going to reach out and gobble it up and take it in. I believe God has a word for every person here today. Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Would you stand today as we read God's word together? Ultimately, this is a sign of respect as we read the scriptures. Uh, but I know that this particular passage of scripture might be especially challenging for many of us to stay tuned in with. So I really want you to lean in to God's word. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amenadab, Amenadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. Now, he's going to mention a lot of kings, but David is the only one that gets the title. That's significant. King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijai, Abijai, the father of Asa, Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Now, some of you uh, might be planning to start a family, and you're going to be looking for a pool of names <laughs> for your future child. Um, and I'm particularly fond of Jehoshaphat. I think it needs to make a comeback. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, 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 the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amon, Amon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud. Abihud, the father of Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Akim. Akim, the father of Elihud. Elihud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Mathan. Mathan, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of of Mary. You see what he did there? Don't miss it. This is um, a very clear genealogy, the so-and-so, the father of, the father of, the father of, and then at the very end, it's like an emergency, this is a biblical emergency break moment where you, you're rocking and rolling down the street and out of nowhere, somebody yanks the e-brake. You come to a screeching halt when he says this, Jacob, the father of Joseph, what do you expect him to say? The father of Jesus. Oh, but I'm not going to give too much away because you come back in two weeks. <laughs> Next week's baptism. We come back in two weeks and you get to hear about the divinity of the Son of God. Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus who is called the Messiah. 
Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Oh, take a breath. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, may your spirit empower and illuminate your word. Drive it into the hearts and lives of your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, in the early church, Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, had incredible priority. One commentator said, Matthean priority was universally upheld. The first gospel had enormous influence and prestige in the early church. During the first three centuries of the church, Matthew was the most highly revered and frequently quoted gospel. So basically, this is the one book that God used to most shape the faith of the early church. Incredibly influential book, really up until the time of the Reformation. It was written around 65-ish A.D., which makes, makes it incredibly reliable. So you have the, the event, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the life ministry of Jesus. Then you have the, the person writing about the event in around 65, 67 AD. And historians will tell you that is a, that is a short, short gap, which means the book that, the, the, the book that we're studying is historically reliable. Genealogies are a big deal in the ancient world. Anybody, to, anybody subscribe to Ancestry.com here? Or perhaps some of you have even gone the extra mile, or maybe you received a gift, the, uh, the genetic test. Anybody? You swabbed your mouth and sent it off, and they did the test, and they found out where your descendants are coming from. Genealogies aren't so much a big deal to us today. We're much more defined by vocation than we are family of origin. However, in some parts of the world today, but especially in first century Israel, genealogies were huge. They were a core part of their identity. This was their resume, telling people who they are and where they come from. One commentator puts it this way. For many cultures, ancient and modern, and certainly in the Jewish world of Matthew's day, this genealogy was the equivalent of a roll of drums, a fanfare of trumpets, and a town crier calling for attention. Any first century Jew would find this family tree both impressive and compelling. Like a great procession coming down a street, we watch the figures out front and the ones in the middle, but all eyes are waiting for the one who comes in the position of greatest honor right at the end. And who comes at the end of the genealogy? This parade of characters is Jesus, the Messiah. Now, how many of you found that genealogy compelling? <laughs> That's our Gentile mind. That's our 21st century Western minds losing the significance. I'm telling you, there's so much here when you stop and pause and ask God to reveal these, the truth of Scripture. Matthew is like a conductor who is unfolding the genealogy of Jesus like a prophetic crescendo that climaxes with Christ. Matthew here, right out of the gate, doesn't use the usual Greek word. The New Testament is written in Greek, and so he doesn't use the, the, the usual Greek word for genealogy. He chooses to use genesis. It's not the typical one, word that someone writing a document would use in his day for genealogy. Genesis. Can you guess what English word we get from that? Genesis. Genesis, the genesis of Jesus the Messiah, which means a new beginning. God is recreating humanity through Jesus. And the, the proton evangelion, the first gospel in the, in the Bible in Genesis chapter 3, when God looks at Adam and Eve and he says, your seed, right? He looks at the serpent and says, you will strike the seed, the, the, you will strike his heel, but he will crush your head. That's the first prophecy of this coming Messiah, this eventually be known as the son of Abraham, the son of David, this king, this savior, ultimately fulfilled through Jesus Christ. One New Testament scholar translates the first verse this way, the book of the new Genesis wrought by Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Let me say a brief word here about names in the Bible. Now, Christ was not the last name of Jesus. It's a beautiful worship song we sang this morning, but what a beautiful name it is, Jesus Christ. So children didn't walk up to Jesus in the day and say, Mr. Christ, I have a question for you. 
Christ was not his last name. It was a title, an incredibly significant title. Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew name for Joshua, which means Yahweh is salvation. Right? So names matter. Jesus, the Christ. Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the anointed one. And these were loaded words for the first, the original audience of Matthew, right? These Jewish minds that are longing for the Messiah. They're dreaming for deliverance. And so when Matthew is using these specific words and these specific names, it's like a dam breaks in the heart and soul of his original audience. All of their hopes and dreams are about to be fulfilled in Jesus the Christ. People in Bible times did not really have last names like we think of last names. They frequently went by something similar to Simon, son of Jonah. Or maybe they were Simon the Tanner. Something a person was identified by with their tribe, Aaron the Levi. Jesus was known as Jesus of Nazareth. So, hello, I am John, son of John. Or I am John of Arkansas. This was a title. We sometimes think the name Jesus Christ refers to his first and last name, but it really means Jesus who is the Christ. And we've shortened it to include all of that, but we don't want to miss the significance of it's not his last name. It is this amazing title that fulfills thousands of years of prophetic history the son of David, the son of Abraham. Talked a little bit about this last week and a little more in our app exclusive content, but this is not in chronological order. So if, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, Abraham comes way before David, a thou, you know, over a thousand years before, but it's on purpose here. Matthew is, is, is writing this on purpose. I want you to get this. He's not sloppy. He's not messy. He's not just throwing things together. It's all intentional. It's communicating something. So when he says the son of David, the son of Abraham, he's a, intentionally arranging the genealogy of Jesus in a certain way to communicate a specific truth. It's not a comprehensive, it's not a comprehensive genealogy. It's not meant to be, which by the way, these are the only genealogies in existence that claim someone is the Messiah. Did you know that? There's another one in Luke. Luke has a different purpose in writing his genealogy, which it was accepted practice at the time. You're packaging the, the genealogy uh, to communicate something specific to a certain group of people. And that's what Matthew's doing here. He's speaking to Jews and he's using the language of his people, the hopes and dreams of his people to communicate, to authenticate the resume of Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, as the anointed one. But there are only two genealogies that we know of that claim to be those of the Savior. And after the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, if someone were to claim to be the Messiah now, we really wouldn't have any way of authenticating it. So if Jesus isn't the Messiah, I don't know who is going to arise that could prove it. But he is the Messiah. This is a real story with real people. This story doesn't start once upon a time. This story doesn't start a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. This story doesn't start with, there was a hole in the ground. <laughs> this is real. This is true. And how do we know it's true? Well, it's God's word, but we'll see it shortly that it includes things that if I were making it up, I would have left out. I would have cleaned it up a little bit. If I were just making this up to impress people, I would have left out a lot of what Matthew intentionally included. He put special focus on Jesus as the son of David. God made his covenant with Abraham. He made his covenant with David. And the promise of Abraham precedes the promise of David. And yet Matthew puts the Davidic promise first. He puts special focus in the genealogy on David being, on Jesus being the son of David in something called gematria. You ever heard of that before? It's a bit of where where letters have numerical value. So it's kind of a, a puzzle, 
a bit of a code. And I believe that the majority of the original audience of, of this letter would have immediately realized what Matthew was doing. Have you ever read before in verse 17? There were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Have you ever read that and thought, there's something more to that? But you just move on. You don't want to Google it. You don't want to take the time. It's maybe your annual Bible reading plan and you're checking off the box and you've just skimmed the genealogy. Let's be honest, we're in church. And you get to that last part, 14, 14, 14. And listen, Matthew arranged it. He intentionally left out people. This is not a comprehensive genealogy. He included people that others would not have included and he left out people that others would have included. But he wanted it, he wanted it to be 14. And the original audience, I think, would have picked up on it, which really, most of us, it gets lost in translation. In Gematria, each Hebrew letter is represented by a number. In Hebrew, David's name is made up of three Hebrew letters. And when you add up the numbers, the numeric value of those letters, guess what number they equal? 14. 14. Matthew is weaving a message into the genealogy. There are layers to his message. And so what I'm trying to do is to pull out these treasures from within the layers to see that Matthew is writing this on purpose. And he's saying it at a surface level. Then he's saying it at a secondary level. Then he says it again at a third level of Jesus is who the Old Testament dreamed for and longed for and, and, and prophesied about. David appears at the beginning of the genealogy, and then he's number 14 on the list of descendants. And then we, you see David again at the end. Matthew is attempting to authenticate the claim that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of David. He will rule forever. And basically in the first verse, Matthew summarizes the entire Old Testament. That's a powerful statement. This first verse is bursting with meaning. Thousands of years, covenants, hopes, dreams, hundreds of characters, and it's all somehow contained in this first verse, the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He bases everything on two foundational covenants, these promises that God makes to specific people in the Old Testament. And these are, what word should I use here? Unbelievable promises. Let me just quickly do a survey of these. In Genesis chapter 12, we find the Abrahamic covenant where Jesus, where God looks at Abraham and Abraham, remember, is a nomad. He's a, ge he's a, he's a, he, he's a geographical nobody. From a dot on the map, he's a shepherd and God looks at him. His wife, Sarah, is barren. They're not able to have kids. They're beyond childbearing years. And he looks at him and says, through your descendants, the planet will be blessed. All the nations of the earth will be blessed through your descendants. And Abraham and Sarah are thinking, he's not talking about us. You, you think that, that he would go to Jerusalem. He, you think he would, no, it wasn't Jerusalem at the time. You think he'd go to the world capital, these influential people, but God chooses Abraham and he is the founding father of the Jewish people. And it's an audacious promise. It's an outlandish promise. It's an unbelievable promise. How in the world is God ever going to fulfill that covenant to Abraham that through one global nobody, this nomad that's a global nobody, God's going to somehow impact the planet. Remember now, at the time, people lived and died within a 100-kilometer circle. This is before media and technology. And maybe today we would think, yeah, you can impact the planet right here from your smart device. But not back in the day. Even now, it would be unbelievable. But then, even more so. And what, what Matthew is saying right out of the gate is Jesus is the fulfillment. How can God impact the planet through the seed of Abraham? It's through the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus in Matthew 28, which we'll get to in a little while. His last words were, go ye therefore into all the world and and." Teach them, baptize them, 
Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. But he says this, go to the ends of the earth. Jesus invested in 12 Jewish men, but they were the means to which God was going to bless the planet, bless the nations. And our presence here today is fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Any Gentiles in the room? And here we are in a place, oceans and continents removed from where this was first spoken to Abraham. Millenniums removed. In Acts chapter 3, verse 24, we, this is after Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit shows up, after the birth of the church. This is Peter's second sermon, and he says this. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. So Peter is saying in the second Christian sermon ever preached, he's saying this is the fulfillment of what God said to Abraham thousands of years before. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, we find the Davidic covenant, which Matthew really brings out here, more so even than the Abrahamic covenant. And he says to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, you can go there and read it yourself. He says, on your throne, there will be a descendant of David on the throne forever. This is outlandish. This is audacious. This is unbelievable. How is God ever going to fulfill this promise when David, when God's people are defeated, when God's people are in exile, when there is no throne for a descendant to sit on? This is the, the covenant promise of God that's ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We're now Jesus, the son of David, born in the city of David as a son of David. Now Jesus is sitting on the throne forever and in fulfillment of the Davidic, comment, the Davidic promise. The Davidic covenant. Jesus is the climax and the culmination of everything. He's the epicenter of God's plan for redemption. The angel Gabriel said to Mary in Luke chapter 1, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus. Remember, Jesus means what? Yahweh is salvation. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Jesus says of himself in Revelation 22, 16, in some of the si final verses of the Bible, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to you to write this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. So we have God fulfilling his promise to his people. God is faithful. God always follows through, always. Even when all hope seems lost, maybe especially when all hope seems lost, we cling to the promises of God. We don't derive our hope from our circumstance. But over thousands of years, God said the Messiah is coming, the son of David. This gets repeated, by the way, multiple times. This becomes the primary source material for the prophets as they, as they inject hope into desperate situations for God's people. This gets repeated by Isaiah. This gets repeated by Jeremiah. This gets repeated by Ezekiel. How is God ever going to fulfill these promises? And they begin in their mind to take it out of the category of truth, and they put it into the category of fable. They put it into the category of fantasy. How can God, how can there be, how can Abraham impact the planet when we can't even, we can't even govern ourselves? How can there be a throne with the son of David on it? We don't even have a throne. Some of us begin to doubt the promises of God because of our history, because of our circumstance. And we need to be reminded that God is faithful. God always follows through. The next thing I want us to see is that we access the promises of God through grace. Questionable characters included in the, in the genealogy of Jesus. Lots of skeletons in this closet. Lots of black sheep roaming around in this genealogy. The shocking thing, listen, is that Matthew chooses to include them. 
Look here in this very first one. This is an, inti- an intentional addition. This is a caveat that Matthew adds. It's an unnecessary caveat. When he says here in verse 3, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. It would, have been a, it would have been a fine genealogy if he had just rolled right through it, but he does that multiple times with these questionable characters in the family tree of Jesus. He goes out of his way to highlight them. These are These are parts of the story that most of us would intentionally avoid. If we're going to present our resume, I'm not going to tell you about the time I got fired. If we're going to present our resume, I'm not going to tell you about all my failures and, oh, this is why you should hire me, you know, because fill in the blank, all of my struggles. This is the resume, and he's intentionally, he's not avoiding it. Rather than hide the skeletons, he's highlighting them. He's showcasing them for a reason, though. This is where we get really into some of the the gospel truth in these first verses of Matthew. The surprising and shocking, especially to his original audience, is that he would include outsiders and outcasts in in this genealogy that's attempting to prove the royal lineage of Jesus as the king of kings. So first thing is women are included in this. Where are my ladies at? Boom, right here. In this, in this patriarchal culture of the first century Ju- Judaism, this was very rare, especially when you're trying to present a royal lineage, a royal bloodline. R- women rarely made it into genealogies. There are four matriarchs in the Jewish world, the mothers of Judaism. Anybody want to take a guess at who they are? First one, Sarah. There we go. Second one. Rebecca, third one, Leah and Rachel. So basically, uh, the spouses of the patriarchs were the matriarchs. And so if you're going to include females in the genealogy of the king of kings, if you're going to include women into the family tree of the Messiah, I would include the matriarchs, but not one of them make it. There's four women included, but they aren't the mothers of Israel. They're the black sheep. Look what he does here. Look, they're, they're... It's incredible that he intentionally includes these in this genealogy. You have Tamar. I'm not going to go there because this sermon needs to remain PG. For real, though. Crazy backstory of Tamar found in Genesis chapter 38. Go there. Read it for yourself later. Basically, summary is this right here. Tamar pretends to be a prostitute and gets pregnant by her father-in-law. Moving on. Whoa! Whoa, but he, he didn't have to include it, but he did. Rahab, backstory found in Joshua chapter 2, she has three strikes against her. One, she's a Canaanite, and now all of us, you know, kind of in our, in our modern mindset, you know, we think, hey, all these people groups were kind of equal, but not in the days, you know, the Jewish people, they were the chosen people of God, and Gentiles were at this lower level of existence. And so the fact that we have... Not just one, but probably three Gentiles included in the genealogy of Jesus is huge. And our Gentile minds don't catch that, but I really want to bring it out. She's a Canaanite. She's a woman, and she's a harlot. Remember I talked about the titles? You know, John the pastor. Rahab the... What's attached to her name? The harlot. Whoa! I mean, that's it's unavoidable. The scarlet letter. Rahab, if you've, been to, if, if you've been around church, you know, and if you kind of picked up on some of the church stories, when you hear Rahab, you think harlot. Harlot, Rahab, Rahab, harlot. Boom, but she's in the family tree of Jesus. Ruth, for her backstory, you can read the book of Ruth. She's a Moabite. She's a, she, she's a Gentile. And then we have this interesting little commentary here about David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Hmm. There's more to that. I don't have time to unpack that. But Uriah, oh, by the way, speaking of your, your um, geography, a part of your identity, Uriah the, the Hittite. So that probably means that Bathsheba, there you go, I said it, 
Bathsheba was probably a Gentile. She was married to Uriah the Hittite. We don't know that for sure, but she was probably a Gentile. But there's these shady characters, these shady characters in the closet that rather than avoid, rather than clean up, rather than edit to present the best version, Matthew intentionally showcases why. There's a message here in how and who, how he arranges, how he packages the genealogy contains incredible truth. Who he includes in this genealogy could, should inject incredible hope into our lives. So here's the wrap-up point. I'm going to drive this home. Number one, God keeps his promises. Even when all hope seems lost, perhaps especially when all hope seems lost. Listen, the primary promise of God in the Old Testament was, hang on, this is not the end. There's a son of Abraham. There's a son of David. There's a Messiah. There's a deliverer coming. Hold on, this is the primary promise of the Old Testament, and we concluded with Malachi, and it was to be continued, dot, dot, dot. It's a cliffhanger. They're waiting, and they're hoping, and they're dreaming, and they're praying, and yet they're still waiting. And then Matthew shows up. The primary promise of the New Testament, let me drive this home, is that this Messiah, and God fulfilled all the promises that he made. It took thousands of years, thousands of years, and the people began to doubt whether or not it was true. They began to think maybe the church just made it up. Maybe it was my grandfather's dream. Maybe it's a fairy tale that we made up to make people feel better at funerals. We, in our mind, we move it from truth to fantasy. And the primary promise of God to the new covenant people in the New Testament is that the same Jesus that fulfilled the old covenant promises is coming back for his people. Amen. But yet, this is the primary. So the Old Testament promise, the covenant, gave hope to God's people during desperate times, during a valley of a shadow that would last for centuries. And yet this primary promise of the New Testament, which is designed to have the same effect on his people, to inject supernatural hope into the valley of the shadow that for some of you have lasted a lifetime, for others it's been generations. For God to say to you, this is not the end of your story. There's more to be written. God is going to return. Jesus will come back. But how many of us think about this? Not very much. The last thing here is that the gospel is for everyone. The gospel is for everyone. Some of you here today, you think, John, it's great and all it's fine. It's church message. That's for you church people. You know, you're holy rollers. You know, you, you don't know my story. You don't know where I come from. You don't know what I've done. I have regrets that would give most people nightmares. And I'm here to tell you now that one of the primary messages of the genealogy of Jesus is that he intentionally included these people that had made massive mistakes, that had massive regret, and yet here they are in the bloodline of the Messiah, the Savior. And if God can use these broken, dysfunctional people, God can and will use you. If God can use my life, if the grace of God can overcome my struggle and my sin and my doubt, if the same grace that worked in the Bible and these broken people, the same grace that worked in my life, his grace is sufficient for every sin in the room and every struggle. We're, listen, where sin increased, I love this, grace abounded all the more. <laughs> grace abounds in the darkest parts of your story. So here's the challenge. Don't invite Jesus into your story. Remember last week, he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And one day, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Jesus is, is patiently waiting on the outskirts of your life. It's stepping into the story of Jesus. It's you stepping into the story that he's writing. And your life is a part of his story. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your amazing, mind-blowing, soul-cleansing, life-changing grace. Thank you for your promises, Lord. Your word says that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness.
So regardless of how unworthy we feel, regardless of how damaged we feel, of how dirty we feel, it's your promise isn't based on our feelings. It's based upon your character, which never changes. Your word says everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So, Lord, we stand on the promises of your word. We know that you are faithful, that you always follow through. Help us, Lord, to step into your story through your grace. In Jesus' name.